I have like two screens now, so I'm like a Luddite. What am I, a pleb? This is what a cock looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy was wearing that as a t shirt yesterday. Our Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing episodes beyond the Walking Dead universe. Sometimes we give you news, sometimes doors slam behind me, but most times we go deep. I'm your host, David Cameo, and I'm joined by Punky Brewster. Bridget, ko-fi.com slash Punky Brewster, that's P-O-N-K-Y-B-R-E-O-S-E-T-E-R. And today we're here at the Drury Inn in, that's lo- not what this is. in lovely Tampa, Florida. I wish it was a Drury Inn because then we'd have dinner. Lovely dinner every night in the Drury Inn where dreams come true and I become Tommy Malibu. It's true. Dave is Tommy Malibu. We're not going to explain that. It's fine. It is fine. We're in Tampa, Florida. For Spookala. But our commitment is undying, unwavering commitment to the podcast because we are literally filming in a potato this whole thing. Is <laughs> well, I'm, I'm in a potato. You're, You're in, in a potato. A- I'm also in a potato. You look fantastic, though. This sofa is easily a potato. <laughs> it looks. It does look like a potato, a baked potato that's it been is. left out, clearly. It's as mushy as one. I think you have to be honest with our audience. It's my unwavering and unbending and unyielding resolve. Oh, that's fair. I'm using resolve very generously when it comes to this recording right here. I mean, look at this. This is a, a Rode shotgun mic that I just rigged up, connected it to earbuds, in order to give you this lovely podcast and Bridget's on my Beats headphone headset mic, which actually sounds pretty good. I use that when we did the boys recording for, I think it was the second to last or third to last episode of the season. And uh, I was stuck in the office. So I used that. Today we're here to talk to you about From's third episode of its third season titled Mousetrap. Sharon and Rachel are in the chat just to mention that. And I think this is the part where I'm going to insert our little conversation that we had earlier because we're all little gaslighters. Rachel, let me see that cup. That's cute. Your little witchy cup. Oh, now she gets close to the mic. It's my little witchy cup. Wait one f- minute. This is why they're echoey, Dave, because they're in the same f- room. <laughs> Wait, no. Is that for real? <laughs> yes. Seriously? <laughs> I'm leaving. You know what's, you know what's also <laughs> funny? We're in the same f- room. Yeah, I, know. I know this is weird why is rachel so echoey what's the technical problem <laughs> also when i do this it looks like i have no arms because i have a potato camera it's a potato camera <laughs> so what happened sharon you drove up there yeah all of my delivery area right now like literally yeah. and i just go somewhere where i can work so i have another surprise dave Rachel and Bridget meet Evelyn. But, um, I'm going to see your well, We kidnapped her. And she's here too. <laughs> For who? I'm going to raise Evelyn. you a... I'm going to raise you a Nick and a Brian. Oh my god! <laughs> Rachel, you know what's really sad? You're not going to be recorded. Because you're in the producer link. <laughs> I started working my way up and decided to come stay here for a few days and work. So I didn't need I've been here, but well, I mean, you just got here, right? Sort no, of. no, I've been here for a few days. <laughs> We've been keeping it a secret. It's been very hard. I think it's to go to school call, so I'm going to go on vacation too. <laughs> <laughs> What's not vacation? One more, <laughs> more surprise, Bridget. The dragon? Did Ray tattoo you? Yep. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I'm jealous now. Fuck Spookala. <laughs> Dang it, fuck Spookala. <laughs> I want to be in Michigan. Here's the door. You can see the latch from here. Michigan is the happening place right now. You can be Tommy Malibu and and start driving. I I really just want to say hi to everybody. And sorry I haven't been around. To the listeners, kind of a gesture. And um, you don't have to apologize at all. I mean, everything, like, we're fine. Everything is fine. Nothing hurt. We didn't lose any property, no damage or anything like that. But west of us is pretty messed up. 85% 85% of my delivery area was in those areas, so I haven't had no work. Rachel was nice enough to let me come up and hang a few days and work here. Same thing with Columbus. I had to stop, and Brian let me crash on his couch. Oh, that's cool. And then I got to meet Nick the next day, too, so that's awesome. That's nice. Rachel and I have been having some fun. I went to work with her last night and got to watch her perform. 
Uh, right. You're so sneaky. You're like, oh, I'll be up early. I'm like, that's not normal. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's weird, but okay. I literally said, as you texted yesterday, I was like, what the f***? I said it out loud, like Dave could hear me. Because this is where my bedroom was. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, this actually... is where Dave's bedroom was. <laughs> So well, he could just hear me I have anytime he talks. Staying in my car, so like I have been getting up early and, and riding around and stuff. <laughs> God, the f- scared me. <laughs> I told Rachel, I'm like, at least you get to be in on the surprise this time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You love a surprise. I do. Yeah, I love, you do. Love gaslighting my friends in a good way. So does Bridget when it comes to Fallout. I'll never forget. What? Oh, because I lied. <laughs> What, what are you talking you? about? It, Dave said I love to gaslight uh, my friends also. <laughs> we love to gaslight our friends. Regarding Fallout. Why don't we just call this the Gaslight Podcast? The logo will be much easier. It'll be like a lamp and with a skull in it and a flame. That winded me. Just running out. <laughs> I was gaslighting you to thinking I was healthy. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm not. I lied. I watched the episode with Rachel, but uh, I'm not into the show, so I'm going out and go to audience and just kind of hang out with you guys. So there's also a good chance that I'm going to go take a nap very soon. So, <laughs> oh well, excuse me. Well, I, I'm not the one decided to do this at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, we really got to get rolling because we're going to have to go to the, the convention soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, audience. I love all you guys, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, I get to cut this out and put this somewhere else. I pick them up, I put them down. And then we're back. <laughs> the magic of editing, because we're in the Drury Inn. <laughs> That's not what this is. You can see the staircase behind you. I was sleeping on the couch. We collapsed it. Bridget's using it to sit. So she was sleeping up there while I was sleeping down here. But we woke up early this morning to watch this episode of From, and... I take my time watching it because I was busy getting notes. So she's far ahead of me. She's watching the episode. And in the middle of my note taking, she goes, oh, my God. (laughs) What? (laughs) And by the way, forever after that, she's like watching 30 Rock. No, she's watching Parks and Rec, I think it was. And then she's like (laughs) laughing all the way. It was like the bottle has been opened on the laughter and the reaction. (laughs) So she just kept reacting to things after that. I'm like, what is going on? This episode started becoming funny. What is happening? (laughs) No, I was watching Parks and Rec after that. No, I actually think I was laughing probably at TikToks. Okay. So I'm just like in a little nest up there and I needed de- to decompress after watching this episode of Rub. <laughs> yeah, so I yelled a lot. and um, <laughs> Even through my noise canceling, clearly you can see them headphones. <laughs> Not these, the ones she's wearing. The ending was very startling to me. Did you see it coming? Because I did not. I did not actually at all. I thought something bad was going to happen. I was like, oh, God. Well, I thought she was right is what I was thinking. I was thinking. like, maybe Tabby's right, and she hasn't actually left. What does that mean, this whole thing? And then the ambulance stops, and it flips over to the driver. And as soon as he said there's a tree, I was like, oh, that was the first. That was oh, the, oh, my, my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> so up to that point, first episode had a lot of action. The second episode had to have tremendous like, the characters. Drama really dealing with what had happened and so i wasn't expecting a lot of action in this one and really it didn't have a ton but then all of a sudden you get that piece at the end so i really enjoyed it a lot of unassuming things happened this episode really unassuming it was just so slow yeah i was like what are these beats what what's happening here every little thing that was happening i was kind of thinking to myself where's the turn okay we're here in the diner and ethan's Cleaning a pot and Bakta's here. That's her, at least her last name, the bus driver. Okay. Boy comes in, is like, I guess, well, I mean, it was touching because he was just taking care of the diner. It's like the only thing you could think of doing because Tian Chen would have wanted it that way. Something Kenny sort of said about Tian Chen looking a certain way afterwards. And I, I like that. But then I was like, okay, where, what's, what's happening here? What's happening with Jim also? He's unraveling, but where's the punchline? Where does it hit? And, and obviously, we're not going to see where that goes until a little later. But okay, even at the cabins, the scarecrows, I guess that's what I'm going to call them, or the totems, as Sharon D would say. It's like, okay, they're gathering crops. There's a little tension. <laughs> Kenny calls Christy a nursemaid. 
Yeah, I knew that something was going to happen out there. I don't know. I have a really bad feeling about what's going to happen moving forward. I don't know what those totems mean. None of us do. But I'm a little wary. You shouldn't have touched them. It's like the Blair Witch Project. Like, just don't touch it. Exactly. Exactly. What an homage, too. And you notice that the the guy that Jade happens to see, it was like a Twilight Zone episode. And I know it's based off of a real story about a man who travels to a distant land. And he sees a residence that is managed by a bunch of monks or what looked like maybe cult leaders. But it looks like monks. It's called the Howling Man, I think it is. And they keep this howling man in the in the in a dungeon, basically behind a, a door. It's basically the it's held by just a simple wooden cane. This door, whatever's inside, could easily get out. And Sharon goes, "Walt is the big boss." That scene where Jade sees the guy tacked onto the tree, similarly to Kelly, by the way, I was thinking of that through his eye socket when they lift up the bars from one of the totems, the support for it, and it falls down. It freed the howling man basically from the dungeon. And then he drinks from the skull and it's maybe blood probably because it's thick and juicy. It was definitely blood. Terrifying, first of all. Well, I didn't like it. It was chocolate sauce. Yeah. Um, so Raspberry chocolate said. sauce, yeah. I didn't like it. I, I, I'm kind of like, can you just stop touching stuff? Leave it can alone. You just, like, you just like stop touching things? Just don't do it anymore. Well, you know, it's funny. I was thinking to myself, like, how do they like, stop themselves from running into these totem things? They're running around doing all this stuff earlier, purposefully not touching any of this. Jade even says, and I noted this, when he walks into town, he's like, oh, maybe these things are like the talismans. They're configured in such a way that they look like the talismans. And they kind of do, like the scratchings on the talismans. They're literal stick figures. And so that's their talisman, leave it alone. But when Christie's in danger, I, I don't disagree with having them do what they need to do to figure this out, but what's the alternative? Yeah, but did you guys try two of you trying to lift the bear trap at the same time? That's a good point. I mean, yeah, you needed leverage, but couldn't you have gotten that leverage another way? You just saw a dude and he grabbed you and arguably that really happened even though nobody else could see him because of the way that like he was standing when Dale walks up. Right, right. But when Dale sees him, he sees thin air, which is unsettling for me. Yeah. Because you think in some sort of way that this place manifests something, but when Dale sees nothing and it's still grabbing hold of Jade, yeah, that's really unsettling because, well, then maybe this is all in their heads and it's messing with it. Oh, I can't process that right now, but okay. Sharon, it's, it's just methane. I'm it's like that episode that. of Tales. No, that no. was Dead City. I'm not doing also, that with you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that with you. Well, Sharon, he also says that the guy was dressed like someone from the 1500s to 1700s. It was like colonial garb. Yeah, he had some unusual costuming. That's too big of a what if. I can't wrap my head around that. I cannot wrap my head around that. It's fine. You're looking at the moon in a distance. You don't know if it's wearing pants yet. That's all I'm saying. I don't want it to be wearing pants. But invariably, it does <laughs> on this show. I'm right about the dumbest things. Speaking of me being right again, oh, maybe. God is confirmation bias, but also confirmation that Tilly says, yeah, also when I was pregnant, I licked the inside of eggshell. Dave, I knew you were going to say this. I knew you were going to be like, oh, that's right. It yeah, is. Yeah. It is my And you're kid. like looking at me like, you know what? No, no, no. Why no. is it going on about Pika? Here's what, the other thing, it? Dave. Okay. But is it normal for a bird to come busting through the window yes. and then slam its head into a wall over and over again until it's dead? Yes. I don't think so. Uh huh. Because I researched that, and it it's is not normal. normal. It's not normal, and I have to say, it's an evil baby. <laughs> Wait, so hold on. You can accuse me of the moon wears pants, but you're like, no, none of these normal things are normal. No, it's an evil baby. baby, monster baby. Yeah, it's a monster. This is the part where you say, "I believe what I believe, Dave." <laughs> it's a monster baby. I'm just saying. So then, then you have to conclude what Charity probably also concludes is that Tilly is a monster. Made so flesh. I haven't engaged the from fandom, even though it would just be people theorizing. I don't want to get spoiled because somebody would be right. So I've just stayed away from it. Like original thoughts, basically. So, yeah. So really, my only interaction with the from fandom is this podcast. If you were here in the chat or if you were in the live chat during the premieres and you were talking to me about from, then that would be my only interaction. With the right. Which is fair. Fandom. Right. But... I did see on Twitter that several people have said that they do not trust Tilly 
That is a fan theory. I don't get Tilly. She's got a, a weird eclectic spirituality that I'm just, I don't really understand what your vibe is. Your leading prayer last season was, yeah, yeah walk and it was a Christian show, prayer. But... Now you're doing tarot. What's your guiding <laughs> principle, lady? What is your like spiritual amalgamation right now is like all of this like stuff that you've like cherry picked together. I don't know, which I mean, people do that. I'm not religious. I'm just spiritual. That's her in a nutshell. She's I'm like not everybody. I'm superstitious, but I am a little stitious. I was with Fatima during this. I'm like, I don't want you to do tarot. It's terrifying to me. Let me read for your word for word what I wrote in my notes, just to kind of give you all a chuckle. Now, if you're new to this podcast, I've said really awful things about people who believe in tarot and astrology and all that stuff. I sometimes dig my heels in a over the top way because I really am. I just hate it so much. Of course, you have to lean into the humor because otherwise you're being really serious and scary for some reason. So I say this, Fatima gets really, really upset. Dave level upset when she suggests that tarot is the solution. Tilly throws it back in her face because, bitch, you see how crazy S out here is all the time and that's your limit? <laughs> tarot? And you don't want people to think you're crazy. Now you're calling Tilly crazy. So like I automatically took the other side of what Dave would normally say immediately after Dave level upset. You and I hold similar beliefs about that. I'm not a big fan of new age spiritualism. Now, some of that is just that I'm Christian, and so I just don't believe that. Well, it's a hoax. I'm sorry, this is going to sound so ridiculous to anyone who does believe it, because I just said I'm a Christian, but to me, it seems like pseudoscience. I see the irony in that. Don't, don't, you don't, you don't worry about it. To me, as a horror fan, this would be the equivalent of someone grabbing a Ouija board and being like, let's consult the spirits on how your baby is. And I'm going to be like, no. <laughs> oh, I see what no, you're saying. No, thank you. Take out Bridget's personal opinion, and what you're saying is that's not what you do in a horror movie. I'm not saying that tarot can't be real because I am Christian, so I do believe that there are spiritual forces that you could tap into. I just think that it's not a good spiritual force. I would be very wary of it. That is scary to me. You're right. I see. So to me, this is like that equivalent, and I would be really afraid, but I also hold a belief system that says, you don't need to know the future. You can want to know it, but you don't need to know it. And so I actively try to avoid any type of spiritualism that tries to like garner that as its main purpose. Right. I mean, even in Judaism, there's a thing where it says, don't trust people who look at the stars, not because they don't know what they're doing, or they don't have some sort of connection to whatever. And it's like anything really. Tilly kind of touches on this specific thing I'm about to say. She says, some people can do it. They just don't understand what they're reading. And that's really the basis of that warning is that they have some understanding of the thing, but they don't have a full understanding of what they're trying to elaborate on or trying to define. I would say that was a pretty clear cut warning. <laughs> She's like, me. I know what I'm doing now. Do you? Uh, yeah. For me, it was like, okay, you know, <laughs> fool me once. Like you turn the card once and the crow hits the window and you're like, that was weird. Well, it, they didn't even get to turn the card yet. They, she asked the question and the she crow hits it a second window. time and it comes flying through the window and then beats its head into a wall until it dies. I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I will preface this because like, I probably sound like a Spanish crusader right now, like with the level of like what I'm saying. That's how I think of you. That's, that's <laughs> literally, that's like, I just want to I just want to clarify, like you do you. Are you, you. my inquisitioner? <laughs> yeah, you do you. If that's part of your spirituality, that's your choice. That's your journey. That's your choice. It's not mine. And I am very wary of it. So I'm scared of this. This seems like this would be dangerous. And then it proves that it is in this moment. Now, I think you could argue this does the thing that Hollywood really likes to do, which is a person who believes in this, I think would think of this as a pretty innocuous act doing a tarot reading. Right. I mean, it's personal, but that that should be just something that you could do. And they're saying, oh, look, it's uh, it's evil. <laughs> crusader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be a crusader. Right no, now. literally what you just did was say, I'm not trying to tell you I told you so. <laughs> no, told you so. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm saying. I was just saying, like, of course, I'm sure someone who believes in tarot and like that's part of their spirituality 
this probably felt really offensive. That's, That's all what I'm saying. saying. That's what I'm saying. This okay. probably felt super offensive. Well, they didn't have the little words at the bottom that says for entertainment purposes only. And then the crow is trying to bust and saying it's the crow, the crow is the legal department. <laughs> saying, I don't, don't, I don't, don't like do it. You. Don't do it. Even put the thing on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think you could argue is the place trying to stop them from doing it. Yes. Because it would be important. The show goes an extra mile to tell you a couple of things. One of which is, okay, when they get to the cabins, Jade says, the scarecrows, we'll call them for now, are arranged in such a way that maybe they didn't need talismans because whoever made them maybe made the talismans, the scarecrows, later on and put them in a hut, let's say for Boyd to find. With the scarecrows arranged as such, it kept the town safe. And if we're calling them scarecrows, the monsters would be crows let's say okay so we have that analogy oh my god wait okay no sure i had this fleeting thought that you may have thought of as well if this is the case crows do sometimes fly into windows sometimes break through those windows either it's a shiny object that it sees in the window that it wants or it sees its reflection and the symbolism behind that if you want to look at the symbolism like tarot is that when a bird flies through your window sometimes a crow it's usually a good sign actually it means that it's the end of some, one thing and it's the beginning of another or it's the end of a bad thing let's say and good things should start to happen i'm not sure but maybe instead of the tarot reading this bird is that symbol for well, fat arguably that's the same thing for the death card in tarot right it's ominous because we think oh that must be bad but it actually usually means rebirth Re why did I say it like that? Rebirth or a, or a new beginning or, or something? We're in the South. <laughs> You're saying all things weird now. No, or normal for you. Talk. It's a symbol of rebirth and new beginnings, new ends. Shut up, Tate. I'm in the right place. Anyway, so what do you think about that? Because I thought maybe the crow also might have thought that Fatima, because you guys oh my invaded God. my brain. Because we assume that the baby. Stop saying Fatima. 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 Fatty. Well, would, you, would you be more comfortable if I called her Fatty? No. Anyway, you guys are so obsessed, and so is Fatima also. She's obsessed with the baby being a demon baby or a monster baby, right? Because she basically almost said it in this episode. But we're making so many assumptions about the baby being the monster baby. We're not thinking about Fatima being a monster. Well, here you go, Dave. And the baby being totally fine. Now, this is from Quora, so take it with a grain of salt. It was delivered by a bot. But here you go. When a crow hits your window, it can have several interpretations, both practical and symbolic. Omen or message. In various cultures, a crow hitting a window may be seen as an omen or a message from the spirit world, often interpreted as a sign of change or a warning. The second option would be awareness. Some believe it can signify the need to pay attention to something in your life that you might be ignoring. In general, if a crow hits your window, it's likely just an accident. But if you're inclined towards symbolism, it could hold personal meaning. For well, you. yeah, I and mean, that's what we do here, in case you're wondering. <laughs> the moon sometimes puts one leg on and sometimes it takes it off. One moon wears pants one leg on at a time, basically. But I was thinking that, yeah, what if the crow recognized its friend? And that friend is Fat Fatima. Is that better? <laughs> they said it that way. Why do you want to call her Fatima? I don't Fatima. understand. That's how you say it. Fatima. That's how you say it. You sound like uh, Harold because that's how he said it in the first episode. Harold Perino. <laughs> yes. And I was like, good Lord, what is happening? Yeah, I'm going to say it how I'm going to say it and you say it how you say it. That's fine. Tomato, tomato. It's like when my dad used to say Fatima, vitamin. Fatima. You're wrong, but it's fine. It's okay. That can be wrong. You know, it's not David. It Rachel. is David. That's how David. I say it now. So. Oh, sh well, technically it is David. So I guess two wrongs make a wrong. <laughs> Again, we're so obsessed with the baby being the monster, but what if the baby's com actually completely fine and we're not looking at Fatima? Uh, I don't I mean, know. It is classic. I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's a misdirect. Maybe yeah. it's a misdirect. There's a likelihood you could die in childbirth. Oh, um, great. That is, that is a classic television trope maybe she has to die for the baby to live well let's put this on pause for a second because one of the things that we said he's like what's your opinion never no, mind no you're stuck <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that alarmed me about these because you get to the end and you're so stuck on the fact that the ambulance is in the stuck place now with henry cavanaugh tabitha's back and all these other people the emt the cop that notice oh it's the lunchbox lady <laughs> okay i get it 
you're right. That is weird. Why? And it's a rope? Anyway. Her delivery was more weird of the line. It was like the thing last episode with that lady from Colony House where I was like, what is your beef, dude? Oh, like, Nikki. why do you extras or you like one liner people, you like background casting? Do you ha have an issue with the cast? Are you guys beefing in real time? <laughs> like, what is happening? Do you guys not get paid it enough? It's delivered like so angrily. If someone had said that to me, I probably would have punched them. Well, listen, Tabitha, she was a captive audience. <laughs> she couldn't do anything at the time. She was kind of like trying to get up to punch her. She was like, oh, my head hurts. Yeah. Oh, I can't. Oh, the room is spinning. But by the way, poor Tabitha, this is like thrown from a lighthouse days ago. <laughs> she got into a car wreck with Henry Cavanaugh. She's well, not having a good week. My concern is there's five people coming in now. That's what I was getting to. I was like, this is the one thing that we said, and that was... When people come into town, other people have to die. Or at least maybe with, was it Christy, Dale, Kenny, Roger, and a woman. So that's five people that are in the cabins. Well, Tian Chen just died. And Tian Chen just died. So that made room for the four people that came in. So if only one person survives the cabins. And, and those people remain in the cabins, the it town is okay. It better be Kenny. Oh, oh no. Oh, no, no then the I line. can't choose between Jade and Kenny. No, but then, and then, but then Kenny said, oh, so this is the, okay. All right. You know what I can say? I can say this hundred percent. It better not be Dale that lives. That is the worst. Well, okay. Cause then it actually goes to the line that Christy says that she reminds Kenny of about what Tian Chen says, which is you'll never be alone. So if you'll never be alone, we'll, we'll all die together <laughs> and Dale will be alive. She's right. <laughs> She's right. Dale lives. Hashtag Dale lives. You know what? If it was Walking Dead, Dale, fine. I don't I, like this Dale. I was thinking of, this Dale's like, the worst. I like this. This Dale is. Remember that joke that we made? This is Bizarro Dale. Me, Elad. <laughs> Not Elad. I don't like him. <laughs> or Laid, as Sharon said, which basically broke our brain a little bit. It's Cockdale. <laughs> this, is, this is what a cock looks like. It's Cockdale, and it's the song from DuckTales. No! <laughs> that is a bop, though, for real. Life is like a hurricane here in the birth. See, like, I want to, like, think of lyrics for Cockdale. Woo! Anyway, sorry. No! Not now. We'll okay. think of it later. <laughs> I don't like this. We'll actually open the show with Cockdale. No! Do, 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 That's why it's good. The beat. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to wrap that up. I don't know if we articulated it this well, but yes, what we sort of established is that for new people to arrive, some people have to go, whether it's dead or away from the town and colony house. Well, I mean, I did think it was weird they brought a bunch of red shirts with them, but <laughs> it's weird that all those people were wearing red. A gal in blue, an EMT in red, another EMT in red. You'll have to keep the cop. The optics don't look good. You know, you got to kill an EMT, right? You got to. You got to kill an EMT. I they gotta, don't know. I don't know cop. what's going to happen with that. I, yeah, I'm, I'm worried. Well, Henry will re hopefully get to reunite with his son sooner than expected. But Victor so. does show up in this episode at Sarah's place, and we never get to see what he, <sighs> the story he tells. We don't. He's been looking at his treasure map. At first, I just thought he was measuring the trees again. Where the trees, which they have visibly moved away from the house. <laughs> they have. Well, or it's that the winter kind of makes it feel like they have. Which is weird. I, it seems like they're a lot further. I remember them being a little bit closer. Oh, so it seems up against the house. <laughs> not butting up, but like, they the were like, like it's and it's probably house. just the way they filmed it, but it looks like it was a lot closer. So anyway, that was weird. But then he realized he's digging. And I was like, oh, so it's like, it's a treasure map. He buried something there. All we know is that it's a suitcase. It was all wrapped up. And then he brings it, it to <laughs> Sarah's house, which is a weird choice. But I mean, if I guess if you're going to be like, I have something really weird in here. Who are you going to go to but the weirdo? That would be the place to go. I <laughs> That's kind of what I was thinking when I was. <laughs> oh, this makes sense. Actually, when he walked through the door, I actually wrote, I was starting to write Julie shows up at Sarah's house because I was thinking, oh, obviously Julie's knocking on the door. She's pissed off at Jim. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Which, yeah. okay, I feel bad for Jim. Julie is really giving it hard to him. We'll go back to Sarah, but that really upset me. No, she has every right. She does, but... She's absolutely every right. As a kid who, I love her. My mom did her absolute best, but I was given a lot more than a seven-year-old should handle at the age of seven because I became a surrogate spouse for my mother 
So the things that she normally would have told my dad after he left, I was the one who had to hear them. So when we were having money problems, I knew about that at age nine. When things weren't going right or my mom was losing her job or whatever happened, I had to know about it as a child. And through much therapy, and it's okay, our parents make mistakes, but that wasn't okay for a seven-year-old to be handed the responsibility of raising her younger brother. So Julie is older. And so there should be some level of responsibility for your siblings at that age, sure. I would argue. But for both of your parents to really be falling apart and then also be getting divorced and not tell you, and then you're kind of just expected to hold everyone together is an unfair expectation on a child. I understand that she's a teen, but it's still an unfair expectation to have for your child. Sure. I think the opposite problem is happening with Jim and Julie than what happened to you, which is which is just as damaging. This is Sharon's biggest complaint too. Information sharing. I really do get Jim not wanting to share this because it would confirm Julie's fears about him losing his S, like she said in one of the prior episodes. I got a call from our son Thomas on the telephone and you weren't there to hear it. By the way, all the things that he was afraid of, Tabitha's dead. Why did you let Tabitha die? The kids are falling apart. So he runs in and gets the kids because he's operating on this fear that this fake Thomas, because he is fake, that this Thomas is telling him. And you're caught between obviously knowing that that's not Thomas, that this place is pushing your buttons. But also, I'm still hoping that it is. But also it sort of saying the thing that he's thinking anyway. So like, do you blame him for not telling Julie? No, also, I don't blame him for that. But here's the thing. Your daughter doesn't have a fully developed frontal cortex. <laughs> you do because you're an adult man. It's not her burden to bear. She has to deal with the fact that her brother died. That's her job. She still has that trauma. It's just a different trauma. Right. But you're the adult and your job is to protect your kids. And so I agree with him not telling her. But the other part of that is I understand you're falling apart because your wife left and you're worried that she's dead. And now your son is calling you on the phone. But I'm pretty sure it's like a Rick at the prison type situation because the kids literally had just walked out of the room and the phone rang. Yep. And it rang again at the, they, near the end of the episode. They were like two steps out of the room when the phone rang. They didn't hear it. Okay, dude, then it's not really there. Or it's only in your head or whatever. I acknowledges that too, because when it rings again, so it's kind of like Tian Chen. When Kenny says, I don't want to see her like that. She wouldn't want me to see her like that. There's an element of that when he, when he picks up and hangs up the phone. There's like, you know, the real Thomas wouldn't want me to be this way. It's better for me not to know what this thing wants me to hear at this point. Yeah. I mean, it's him putting his foot down. From that. But I think for the outside, everyone could be like, yo, Julie's been a real B. Because we haven't gotten a ton of character development out of her. She's not an easily connectable character. All we've seen is her be really mean to her brother, probably because she's extremely resentful that he has been protected and she has not, which is what happens I mean, before. when you're the older sibling. Yes. Then she's trying to kind of like repair that relationship and be there for him as things move on. But you don't know anything else about her. Not really. We know she's been through some really hard stuff already in real life and also in this weird area. Her parents fell apart. She found out that they were going to get divorced, even though they didn't tell her. And so there's another breach of trust and confidence there. And she's young, but she's starting to get to the point, which usually happens for people in like their late 20s, 30s, when you realize your parents, because they've been your parents your whole life, to you, they're miraculous in some kind of way they have like superpowers that they're just a regular person who also doesn't know what they're doing but that is a really hard concept to grasp and hold on to i even still struggle with that and i'm in my late 30s because that's a hard truth to live with is that your parents are also human and your parents also make mistakes i don't think that she's being too hard on jim i think he's falling apart but you got to keep it together for your kids dude you have to by the way, I, I want to say, I'm, I don't disagree with you. Julie is not wrong for feeling the way that she does. I just think Jim is having a hard time navigating this because it's one thing if you're in the outside navigating this situation with a child who can't handle a divorce, let's say. We'll use that example because it's there. It's another thing to realize that this place loves to play on your worst fears. And one of the biggest things about this place is that it gets itself to do for some reason, because people don't want other people to think that they're crazy. 
is it gets people to not share the things that they see, which is probably what people should be doing. Tilly touches on it on this episode. She says, you think you're crazy? You just don't understand what you're going through because I went through it too. Let's just say that's true. Let's not start calling other people crazy just yet because here we are in this place where it's the big ball of fire in the sky. We take for granted the things that we think are crazy that are actually more normal than we think that they are. Well, it goes back to the season one statement that this isn't the norm for us. So that's why this is hard to process. So this place is hard to deal with because it's not our normal reality but it is the reality of that place. To take that one step further, this is this this place is normal. I get it. It doesn't help Jim or Julie in this situation. And I didn't really bring this up to kind of focus in on this that much, but that it's just happening. It's a hard thing to watch because it's like watching a train wreck. Let's go back to Sarah and Victor briefly. I thought that Julie was going to be the one to head over to Sarah's place. It ends up being Victor. And so it's a good pairing. I thought, okay, yeah, who better? than Sarah. But then I wonder, okay, what is Victor about to unload on Sarah in his story tent fort? That's what I took from that. But Oh, yeah, that's what it's going to be. But I don't know. We'll just have to wait. I don't really think there's anything you can theorize about that. I think what you can say, though, is what we saw in the last episode in that he kind of pushes Ethan away. He says, this is what this place does. It makes people die. And it pushes Ethan onto a journey, which he obviously does to upset Jim Lee in this episode. Between seeing the cow carved up and Donna having to witness his comments saying, oh, that's what things look on the inside. And then he says, what about mom? Who's going to bury mom? Does she stay out there and rots eventually? So I guess he's taking Victor's words to heart. And that eventually leads Victor down to where Sarah is as a result of that. I'm kind of wondering where that goes. Who more of an outsider? Because I think he's seeking to be on the outside of things because he feels, again, it's the reason why he survived. When he's around people, people start dying. Yeah. And so who better to be around than the person who wished to die the most? Low risk, high reward, you know, that situation. Well, you wanted to die anyway, so I'll just hang out with you, I guess. Yeah, right. Exactly. You won't mind. Let's solve this thing together. That's horrible. I know. I needed to backtrack a little to kind of have this make sense because it does make sense but why it all makes sense what do you mean with all the pieces sarah's pieces victor's pieces kind of coming together but what upsets me a little bit about that because we started talking about henry finally maybe because he's in a bad way reuniting with his son but if his son's about to do something stupid with sarah that seems like a sad thing that won't happen oh uh, i didn't think that's what that was i feel like that might lead up to that part I think this has something to do with his personal story, like the years we don't know about. He was Mm. alone for a really long time. True. And there's a lot we don't know about him. Yeah. Everything he says is like, I don't want to talk about that right now. Or that some of his mom's stuff or something. I don't know. If you really want to know my actual fear, which is concerning maybe that this is where my psyche went, I feel like it's his sister's body. Oh, and he just wants to know if he's crazy. Is she still inside here? That's where my head went. I, I can't tell you. Is this real, Sarah? Do you see a body in this tree? I can't tell you. It's where my head went. He told us where he buried his mom. To my knowledge, I do not remember him telling us where he buried his sister. Sister Eloise. I'm glad you said something because I didn't think that. <laughs> okay, well. At all. That's where my morbid brain went, but. We have to bury Eloise to stop the monsters from coming. It's okay. pretty messed up, so I don't oh, know. I don't God. really want to. <laughs> really want to focus on it. But it has to be you. And he hands her the trunk. (laughs) There's something else that we need to talk about. And that little conversation that Boyd has with Father Khatri, who's not Father Khatri, it's important to remember that because I think Boyd is doing a bit of leisure demand, like sleight of hand with Father Khatri. I think he doesn't trust what he says anymore, similar to Abby or Fabby, fake Abby. Oh, that's interesting. Because I think he's working with his hands, and Father Katri assumes that what he's building is something to catch the monsters. And he says, you always make it about you. And then he goes, um, actually, mm-hmm. this is a memorial board, Father Katri. I don't know what you were thinking. I thought that was a nice idea, because I was like, he's right. There are no tombstones out there. They don't have any grave markers, which is interesting. I would have assumed they would have made graves, but I guess they wood is a limited resource, so... I mean, the only one that seems to have an actual grave marker is Abby Stevens. It has mm-hmm. her name and everything. Yeah. 
But what I was thinking throughout the entire thing was it's not immediately clear that Boyd mistrusts Father Katri, but I don't think that's a memory board. I think that's part of what he's trying to build to catch something or some, I don't know. Because I keep thinking to myself, the monsters know what they see. They don't know what's inside these people's heads necessarily. They can extract only so much. Maybe it's a way to cover the talisman so that they don't know. Something or maybe it's on the back of the talisman so he can put it on the wall or whatever when he traps one in. Right, so it's not obvious that it's there. Sure. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe the talisman, I'm just thinking to myself, something stupid. Maybe the talismans don't really work. And it, the idea of the talismans working keeps pe- people's hopes alive, right? So that when they do screw up or the talisman falls on the floor, then they can come in. And so let's well, say it comes I in. I don't know. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no to that, Dave. I'm not even going to allow that because he fell <laughs> into a pit with a ton of them there. And that's how the monsters didn't follow him. Well, yeah, the talisman hunt, right. Yes. There's no other rhyme or reason. He didn't even have hope in that moment. He was just terrified that he was going to die. Right. It's just interesting because if these monsters could see everything, or mo- I say monsters, but we don't know what the entity is or whatever the force is behind even the monsters, right? There's a hierarchy, as Sharon said. But whatever's operating these monsters to see everything. And so they would be aware of its presence on a given surface or like on the wall or something that they can see on a surface level. But it, anyway, I wasn't even thinking that far ahead. You brought it up like, oh, maybe they hide the towels behind the board or whatever. No, I wasn't I thinking that, but you did. But what I was saying was, Whatever it is, it's like a sleight of hand. He's building something. He says it's a memory board, but maybe it's it's like, okay, as long as this thing is watching me, I'm not going to let him see what I'm doing. I'm going to make it look like something, but it's going to be for something else. Yeah, maybe. And it seems to work because the fake Father Katri, Father Fatri, he assumes this is for the trap. And then he's like, um, actually, it's a memory board, but it's not a memory board. And maybe this was him testing out Father Fatri and trying to see if they can see into his mind about what he's about to build or whatever to catch one of these things. Maybe. I'm really curious as to the limitations and him having that information and confirming it in that moment might be a tell. Is the bus close to the church? If he wants to be in the bus so he can watch them, I assume it's not really to watch them. I assume it's for this trap that he's setting up. Because the thought is, if he's laying the trap and part of it is in the church, then he needs to have access to the church after dark to be able to get there quickly. Right. And it's one thing that that's very clear is that the bus has a full view of everything in the town. Well, that's what Randall kind of says all the time. It's like, I could see everything and everyone and the monsters are everywhere. Which by the way, seeing him and his state and seeing the cicadas again or whatever it was, I don't know if there were cicadas, but I heard the sound and it sounded like cicadas makes me think that he's not been getting much sleep since he's been back. The only person who seems okay is Marielle. Julie's not okay. Randall's not okay. Marielle seems okay for some reason. Well, Marielle seems seems okay, but I think even you guys sort of alluded to the fact that she seems too okay, too positive. I was like undetectable. Like she seems like another person all of a sudden. Maybe she's been taken over. <laughs> By the day in the front. I can't. I can't. No, we're doing. No, no, no. Okay, nope. let's move oh, on. The moon's, oh, he's putting on one leg. Yep, I can't do it. Let's move on. <laughs> we're going too off the rails here. All right, take off your shoes, Moon. <laughs> no more pants for you. So Rachel says the suitcase was clearly buried. Yep, yep. It's clearly that which he dug up earlier at the tree line. Well, he knocked over the stick figure, so obviously the dream demon is back. Well, you know, or something to that effect. Something was let loose again that was... I don't know. There's yeah. way worse things out in the woods. That's what they say. Yeah. It's funny. Had that end scene not happened, I would have said, oh, nothing happened in this episode. Not really. Sort of. They're setting up a bunch for next episode. So I feel like next episode is going to be kind of a doozy. I-, I was thinking that too. Like, actually, I was thinking more along the lines of, well, isn't this a lot more like season one? Where a lot of the episodes are sort of setting up the next episode or setting mm-hmm. up the... Episode yeah, because that. we've got the five people out by the cabins and something is obviously going to happen there. We've now got Tabitha coming back with these people. So obviously something is going to happen there because they're going to have to be convinced that this town is what it is. It is good. They have more medical personnel. Oh, no. Yeah, Rachel. We have to oh, mention that it's Rachel. No. Oh, no, Rachel. Let's read the whole thing again. So Rachel says in the chat, because they don't know that we're reacting to that. It's good that they have more medical personnel now and supplies. And you reacted to that because... Let's put two and two together. We said when people come in, people die. It's good there's more medical personnel now. 
And that they're not going to be? Oh, because Marielle's going to die? No! Christy's going to die. Christy's going to die. Uh, you're never going to be alone, Boyd. Well, you won't have anything to do with it. You'll be stuck with Dale. <laughs> well, she gave her a little speech, so maybe it's time. Yeah. I don't know, but... That, that's interesting. Anyway, so we've got the people out by the cabins. We've got Tabby coming in with all these people in the ambulance. We've got Boyd setting up some sort of trap for the monsters. So there's three separate storylines here. The baby thing, that's nine months in the making. But we do have the crow broke into the house. Waking up so, Elgin, by the way? Poor Elgin. It's like, no matter what, he can't sleep. What is this setup Why'd you have to that? do a tarot reading right next to a sleeping man? <laughs> I think, no, it was You're across... You're like, this is as good a spot as any. It was across the room. The crow flew across the entire hallway and landed near Elgin. Dave, go back and watch that scene again. They walked two steps away from Elgin. She like grabs it out of the drawer and they're like, one, two, there's a table right there. Well, I, okay. Yeah. But the point is they weren't doing the tarot reading on Elgin's forehead is what I'm saying. They might as well have been. <laughs> they're like, oh, he's sleeping. He doesn't get much sleep. Anyway, shuffle these cards. No, this, no, this is, it's more like this. It's more like this. All right. Let's be real quiet because Elgin's sleeping on the other side of the room. Ask your question. Is my baby okay? It's what it might as well have been. So anyway, that's that's many months in the making, so I don't know that we're gonna get anything there right, right away. Right. But then we've also got Victor and his suitcase. So there are essentially four storylines that are set up now to like play out something probably wild in this next episode. I think this next episode is gonna be a doozy. Bomb diggity, probably, hopefully. Okay. I think we can leave it there because we have enough on our plate. So a particularly short one this episode, but if you like what you heard, head over to ratethispodcast.com slash squawking dead. Five stars and a scarecrow. I don't know if there's an emoji for that, but do an emoticon stick figure of the talisman and tell us what you liked. Tell us what, I'm giving you work for some reason. Why am I doing that? There's no scarecrow emoji. No, but there you can make a stick figure in your rating. Yeah, see, Rachel just did it in the chat. I don't know what that is, but oh, it looks like a winky it's face. A si no, it's a sideways stick figure. Oh, it is a sideways stick figure. I had to tilt my head because I'm dumb. Anyway, five stars and an emoticon that looks like a stick figure sideways is all we need to know that you love us. But tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't like. Tell us what we might have missed. We probably missed a lot. I think we covered it pretty much, though. But tell us after every single episode. It really, really does help. We've worked really hard to get this episode to you, clearly. I hope you see that. This is a very ramshackle, jerry-rigged sort of thing. But if you really like what we're doing, you can tip us on Kofi, get the unedited episode recording, as well as the pre-squawk insights for 30 days. And if you're really into us, you kind of want to date us, you want to go steady with us. It's just like the Christian's Children Fund. Sponsor Squawking Dead for as little as $4 a month with the walkers tier. And you'll get even more Discord access than when you tip us. It's still forever access. You'll just get more of it. As well as a bunch of perks in the Kofi shop for free. If you're really into us and you want to, you Only know. 13 cents a day, Dave. So for 13 cents a day, you can join the Walker's Day. <laughs> it's sponsor is squ a squawking dead. It is less than St. Jude's. So Thank you, Sherry. It is. How affordable. And you could be helping me to hopefully not deal with Dave as often. Actually, just give money to me. <laughs> just, yeah, go to ko Don't give money, Don't give money to that. Give it to That's P-U-N-K-Y-B-R-U-I-S-E-T-E-R. Give her all the monies, everybody. I want monies. <laughs> For a little extra, you decide to join the Whispers, Survivors, or Great M tier, you can get access to our Jackbox Games live streams, a free classic t-shirt from our merch store, as well as discounts in the Kofi shop, decide to join the survivors and great M tier. You can join us on screen during these recordings, lending us your thoughts along the way with your face mouth mic. And if you decide to join the great M tier, you will also receive among all other perks, which you can read on Kofi and Patreon. It's fully laid out. You'll have access to our core channel on our discord, which gives you the ability to join our private conversations, discussing the behind the scenes things that we need to discuss without the audience. Things like budgets, where should we go for cons, where should we not go for cons, how much money we should spend, what we should be doing. You have a lot more weight in these conversations because you have access to them. In any case, I'm your host, David Cameo, and I was joined by the lovely Bridget. You can hear it from her mic because she's in the same room as me. Ko-fi.com slash Punky Brewster. It's P-U-N-K-Y-B-R-O-S-E-T-E-R. And Rachel and Charity in the chat. And Rachel says, money, please. Money, please. Money, money, money. <laughs> Bye, everybody. That's it. Parks and Rack, Dave. That's it. <laughs> That's it. 
Good night, everybody. We'll see you soon. A good morning for us. Love you guys. I'm glad you get to be together, Karen and Rachel. Yeah, me too. It's really odd together. that you didn't tell us, but that's cool. It's classic charity. I want a tattoo. <laughs> that's it. No, I want a tattoo. Tattoos, please. Is my baby okay? Thank you again for listening to another episode of Squawking Dead. This one being a little bit more ad hoc than our normal production value, but we were in Tampa for Spookala, promoting ourselves on Suki Martinson's table. You should check her art out. She's a really great friend. I enjoyed spending a lot of time with her, meeting new people, meeting some of the actors from The Boys, meeting some long overdue actors like Tyler Labine. It was just overall a really great time. But we reached the part of our episode where we acknowledge our supporters, mainly the Great M Survivors and Whispers tier members, among whom, starting with the Great M tier, our producer tier, at Real Ryan GM on Instagram and X, the one and only, because there are no more Great M or Survivors tier members, we could really, really use your support about now because we are sort of uh, losing money because of our episode release pace. We're having to use Vetan, our editor, to publish releases, which means we're having to pay him, which means if we aren't able to pay him, we aren't able to keep up with the demand and we will fall behind. And I don't think any of us wants that. So consider joining a membership tier on either Kofi or Patreon. Moving on to our Whispers tier members, lapping the Survivors tier members because there are none. We've got at Judith.Morton on Instagram. On Facebook, we have at Kim.Rowley, the number one, and at Sandy.D.Morrison. Last but not least, we have Aiden Atkin, who you can reach on ko-fi.com slash Aiden Atkin. I gotta say, I'm really enjoying the pace of this third season of From. I hope you are too. And if you aren't, or you are, let us know what you think in your review or rating by heading over to ratethispodcast.com slash squawking. We really want to know, and we will probably discuss your thoughts on the next episode. But remember, in the meantime, that we, you and me, are squawking dead. <laughs>